What are some good conductors of electricity? In order to be an effective conductor, a material must allow the electrons to move easily throughout it. The atoms in good conductors, such as most metals, have one or two electrons that can be easily freed from the nucleus to move through the material. Water is a fair conductor, but when salt is added it becomes a better electrical conductor. What are some good conductors of electricity? In order to be an effective conductor, a material must allow the electrons to move easily throughout it. The atoms in good conductors, such as most metals, have one or two electrons that can be easily freed from the nucleus to move through the material. Water is a fair conductor, but when salt is added it becomes a better electrical conductor. How was electricity used as a form of entertainment? In the mid-1700s demonstrations of electrostatics were extremely popular. Especially in Parisian salons, where wealthy men and women gathered to discuss events of the day. Benjamin Franklin, 1706-1790, was a popular guest. In Stephen Gray's most famous demonstration. Called the Flying Boy Experiment. A boy was suspended horizontally using two silk threads hung from hooks placed on the ceiling. When a charged tube was held near his foot, pieces of metal foil were attracted to his face and to his outstretched hands. Louis Guillaume L. E. Monnier discharged a Leyden jar through. A chain of 140 courtiers in the presence of the King of France. Jean Antoine Nollet, 1700 to 1770, attempted to measure the speed of electricity by having a line of monks one kilometer, 3,280 feet, long hold hands. The monks at the ends of the line touched a machine that produced charge. They all jumped simultaneously when they felt the painful shock. So he concluded that electricity moved instantaneously. What is three-dimensional, 3D, vision? Seeing in three dimensions, which is how a person with normal eyes sees. Means that in addition to perceiving the dimensions of height and width, such as seen on a piece of paper, a poster, or a TV or movie screen, one can see the third dimension of depth. We see real objects in 3D because we have two eyes that See slightly different perspectives of the same view. The combination of these views, when interpreted by our brain, gives us the ability to perceive depth, the third dimension. If you close one eye, your ability to perceive depth is eliminated. With only one eye, the world won't look very different to you but you'll experience difficulty in judging distances.
What is farsightedness and what can be done to correct it? Farsightedness, or hyperopia, occurs when the lens of the eye can see objects far away. But cannot focus in on objects at closer range. The cornea and lens of the person with farsightedness cause the image to focus behind the retina. Resulting in the images from objects close to the eye to be blurred. In order to correct for farsightedness, a convex lens is used to converge the light rays closer together. Permitting the image to fall on the retina. The rigidity in the eye lens that affects older people. Making them unable to focus on close objects, is called presbyopia. How does a camera lens create an image on the sensor? The diagram below shows what would happen if there were three pinholes. Each creating an inverted reproduction of the object, see page 211. Now, if a converging lens is placed just behind the pinholes it will bend the rays going through it. If the focal length of the lens and the distance between the lens and screen are chosen correctly. Then the three reproductions from the pinholes will all be at the same location. Light rays from the top of the object will converge on the appropriate point on the image. Note that the image is inverted and the same size as the reproductions. What is refraction? Refraction is the bending of light as it goes from one medium to another. The most common use of refraction is in lenses. Eyeglass lenses refract light so that the wearer's eyes can focus the light properly. A magnifying glass is used to see enlarged images. Lenses in cameras produce an image on the film or CCD sensor. Refraction also occurs when sunlight strikes Earth's atmosphere and when it goes through water. What is the shape of a lens when focusing on objects far away and objects up close? The ciliary muscle, responsible for changing the shape of the lens, adjusts its tension to focus on different distances. When focusing on objects far away, the lens needs a large focal length. So the muscle is relaxed in order to make the lens relatively flat. When an object is closer to the eye, however, a shorter focal length is needed. The ciliary muscle contracts, reducing the focal length of the lens by making it more spherical. The process of adjusting the shape of the lens to focus in on objects is called accommodation. How does this happen? The rod attracts positive charges and repels negative charges. Neutral objects contain equal numbers of positive and negative charges. 
in a conductor the charges are free to move and so the electrons can be pushed to the far end of the object making it negatively charged and leaving the close end positively charged. An object that is neutral but has separated charges is polarized. What is the focal length of a lens? The focal length measures the strength of a lens. Consider a converging lens. Rays from a very distant object come together at the focal point. The focal length is the distance from the lens to the focal point. Lenses with very convex surfaces have shorter focal lengths. While flatter lenses have longer focal lengths. For diverging lenses the focal point is virtual. That is, it is the point from which the diverging rays leaving. The lens would have come from if a point object were placed there. What makes an object positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral? The massive nucleus of an atom consists of positively charged protons and unchanged arc neutrons. It is surrounded by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. Normally atoms are neutral, the number of electrons equals the number of protons in the nucleus. A negatively charged object is an object that has an excess of electrons. A positively charged object has fewer electrons than protons in the nucleus. What are the two ways to charge an object? When a rubber rod is rubbed with fur, the fur transfers electrons to the rubber rod. The rod and fur, originally neutral, are now charged. If an object touches the rod some of the excess electrons on the rod can move to the object, charging it. The rod, which is now negatively charged because it has excess electrons, can attract positive charges. This method is called charging by contact. But, as you observed with the cellophane tapes, your hand and other neutral objects attract both positively and negatively charged objects. How do fluids model electric charges? How could these results be explained? Charles Frangois Dufay, 1698-1739, concluded that there were two types of electricity. He named them vitreous, meaning glass, precious stones, and raisinous, amber, sealing wax. Silk. Friction separates the two types. When they are combined they neutralize each other. Jean Antoine Nollet modeled these types as two fluids, each composed of particles that repelled each other. Charging amber gave it an excess of raisinous fluid. Charging glass with silk gave it an excess of vitreous fluid. When the two were touched together the fluids combined with each other leaving the objects unchanged argued.
Benjamin Franklin believed there was only one fluid. When glass was rubbed the fluid filled the glass. When amber was rubbed the fluid left the amber. He called an object with an excess of fluid positive and one with too little fluid negative. When they were touched the fluid flowed from the glass to the amber. Leaving each with its proper amount of fluid. The flow was likened to water in a river. The electrical tension, difference in potential, and electrical current were analogous. To the difference of water levels between two points and of the amount of water transferred. How is a camera similar to? and different from, the eye. A camera performs many of the functions of the eye. It has a lens to form an image on a photosensitive surface. The lens must be able to form sharp images of objects both close and far away. The amount of light reaching the photo detector must be controlled to make the exposure correct. In older cameras the photosensitive surface was film. Today cameras use a digital sensor. These sensors are small most are between 3 eighths and 1 in size but contain as many as 10 million separate light detectors called pixels. Each pixel is covered by a red, green, or blue color filter so the camera can produce full color images. A camera's lens isn't flexible like the one in the eye. But the distance between the lens and the sensor can be varied. Bringing a distant object into focus requires that the lens be closer to the sensor. A close object requires that the lens be moved further away. The amount of light is controlled two ways. One is to have an aperture that can be opened to admit. More light or close down to reduce the amount of light. The second is a shutter that controls the amount of time light is allowed to reach the sensor. While leaving the sensor exposed for a longer amount of time is needed when the light is dim. It also will cause a blurred image if the object is moving. Thus it is important to select the correct combination of aperture and shutter speed to take good pictures. Why does a rubber balloon that has been rubbed in your hair stick to a wall? The attraction between a charged balloon and a wall is the result of electrostatic forces. When rubber is rubbed on human hair or a wool sweater, electrons transfer easily to the rubber balloon. The balloon is charged by rubbing the hair or sweater. Fuzz may stand up as a result of the excess positive charges repelling each other. When the balloon is brought near the wall, it polarizes the wall. Moving the positive sources toward it and repelling the negative charges away. The negatively charged balloon is attracted to the many positive charges in the wall. As long as the electrostatic force and frictional force between the balloon and the wall are stronger than the gravitational force pulling the balloon down, the balloon will remain on the wall.
How close can an object be before it appears blurry? There is a limit as to how close an object can be to the eye before the lens can no longer adjust its focus. Up to about 30 years of age. The closest an object can be focused is approximately 10 to 20 centimeters, 4 to 8 inches. As one grows older, the lens tends to stiffen and it becomes more difficult for the person to focus on close objects. In fact, by the time a person reaches the age of 70, their eyes cannot focus on objects within several meters of their eyes. As a result, most aging adults need reading glasses to focus on close objects. How does the human eye see? The eye is really an extension of the brain. It consists of a lens to focus the image. An iris to regulate the amount of light entering the eye, and a screen called the retina. The cells of the retina do some preliminary processing of the information. They receive then send signals along the optic nerve to the brain. The cornea is a transparent membrane on the outer surface of the eye. Between the cornea and lens is a fluid. Light refracts when going through the convex surface of the cornea into the fluid. In fact most of the focusing of light in the eye occurs at the cornea. Light passes through the iris that opens and closes in response to the amount of light entering the eye. The iris can only change the amount of light to a going through it by a factor of 20. While our eye can respond to differences in light level of 10 trillion. The major task of the iris then can't be to control light intensity. In addition, when the opening in the iris shrinks the eye can keep objects in focus from a wider range of distances. After passing through the iris the light goes through the lens. The lens consists of layers of transparent fibers covered by a clear membrane. In order to focus in on objects that we want to see, our eye changes the shape. And thus the focal length of the lens and cornea by contracting or relaxing the ciliary muscle around the eye. Light then passes through a liquid called the vitreous humor. That fills the major volume of the eye and falls on the retina. The cornea and lens have created an inverted image on the surface of the retina. The retina is composed of a layer of light-sensitive cells, a matrix of nerve cells, and a dark backing. There are two kinds of light-sensitive cells, cones and rods. The 7 million cones are sensitive to high light levels and are concentrated around the fovea. The part of the retina directly behind the lens. Surrounding it are some 120 million rods that are sensitive to low light levels. The entire retina covers about 5 square centimeters. There aren't 127 million nerves in the optic nerve that goes to the brain. So a system of nerves in the retina do some preliminary processing of the electrical signals produced by the rods and cones before sending the results to the brain.
How does a pinhole camera work? A pinhole camera is typically made from a box with a small pinhole in one side of the box and a screen on the other side. The pinhole is so small that only a very small number of light rays can go through it. The diagram on page 211 shows how a pinhole creates a reproduction of the object on the screen. Note that it is not an image because light rays do not converge on the screen. Pinhole cameras are easy to make and are often used during solar eclipses because it is very dangerous to look directly at the sun, during an eclipse or otherwise. With the sun at your back, point the hole up toward the sun and view the image of the moon passing in front of the sun on the screen. What combination of charges causes attractive and repulsive forces? As you observed, unlike gravitational forces, which only attract masses to each other. Electrostatic forces can either attract or repel charges. Like charges, positive positive or negative negative, repel each other. Unlike charges, positive negative, attract each other. A common phrase describing many human social relationships. Opposites attract, holds true for electrostatic forces. What is the difference between cones and rods? Cones are cone-shaped nerve cells on the retina that can distinguish fine details in images. They are located predominantly around the center of the retina called the fovea. The cones are also responsible for color vision. Some cones respond to blue light, being most sensitive to 440 nanometer wavelengths. A second kind has peak sensitivity in the green, 530, manometer light. The third is sensitive to a wide band of wavelengths from cyan through red. Its sensitivity peaks in the yellow, 560 nanometers. As the distance grows from the fovea, rod-shaped nerve cells replace the cones. The rods are responsible for a general image over a large area, but not fine details. This explains why we look at objects straight on when examining something carefully. The image will be focused around the fovea. Where the majority of cones pick up the fine details of the image. The rods being much more sensitive in low light levels, are used a lot for night vision. What is the index of refraction for light traveling through different media? The following are some sample indices of refraction. The index of refraction, represented by n, is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material. The larger the index of refraction, the greater the bending that takes place.
What is a diverging lens? A diverging lens has at least one concave side. The shape of the lens causes the entering light rays to spread apart when they leave the lens. A diverging lens is often used in combination with converging lenses. Eyeglasses to correct nearsightedness use diverging lenses. What are some good conductors of electricity? In order to be an effective conductor, a material must allow the electrons to move easily throughout it. The atoms in good conductors, such as most metals, have one or two electrons that can be easily freed from the nucleus to move through the material. Water is a fair conductor, but when salt is added it becomes a better electrical conductor. What is a converging lens? A converging lens has at least one convex side. Its shape causes the entering light rays to converge, that is, come closer together. A converging lens can create a real, inverted image that may be projected on a screen. When used as a magnifying glass it creates a virtual, upright image. What allows nocturnal animals to see better in the dark than humans can? There are three main reasons why some animals can see better than humans can at night. The first reason is that their eyes, relative to body size, are larger and can gather more light than human eyes can. More light results in a brighter image. The next reason has to do with the rods and cones in the nocturnal animal's eyes. Cones are used for detail and work best in bright light. A nocturnal animal has little need for the color vision provided by the cones and therefore has more room for the rods that detect general information such as motion and shapes. The third reason why nocturnal eyes excel in the absence of light is due to the tapetum lucidum. A membrane on the back of the retina that reflects light back to the retina to double the retina's exposure to light. The reflective tapetum can be seen in the light reflected back. Out of animals' eyes at night when you shine a flashlight on them. How does Earth's atmosphere affect the apparent locations at which we see stars? The light from stars refracts slightly as it enters Earth's atmosphere. Refraction is largest nearest the horizon. As a result the true position of the stars is a bit off from where we observe them. Refraction of light from the sun results in sunrise being slightly earlier than it would be without the atmospheric refraction, and sunset is slightly later. Refraction also distorts our view of the sun and moon when they are very close to the horizon.
When were lenses first made? The word lens comes from the name of the lentil bean because of the similarity in shape of the bean and a converging lens. Lenses have been used for over 3,000 years. It's possible that ancient Assyrians used them as a burning glass to start fires. A burning glass is mentioned in a play by Aristophanes written in 424 BCE Roman emperors. Used corrective lenses and knew that glass globes filled with water were able to produce magnified images. Al Haytham Al Hazen, 965-1038 CE, wrote the first major textbook on optics. That was translated into Latin in the 12th century and influenced European scientists. Shortly thereafter, in the 1280s, eyeglasses were used in Italy. The use of diverging lenses to correct nearsightedness, myopia, was documented in 1451. Today, lenses used in eyeglasses and cameras are usually made of lightweight plastics that are cheaper and more durable than traditional glass lenses. What wavelengths of light are our eyes most sensitive to? Our eyes are most sensitive to the wavelengths corresponding to the yellow and green colors of the spectrum. Flashy signs and some fire engines are painted in a yellowish-green color to attract our attention. Even simple objects such as highlighters. Used to emphasize words or phrases while taking notes, are typically bright yellow and green. When we glance over something or see an object out of the corner of our eyes, we are more likely to notice bright yellowish green objects than red or blue objects. Because the eye is less sensitive to these wavelengths. What would happen if you had a multitude of pinholes at the location of the lens? The reproductions from all the pinholes would be at the same location and many more rays from the object would end up at the same place on the image. The image would be much brighter. So, you can model the formation of an image by a lens as a collection of reproductions of pinholes. The larger the lens, the brighter the image. How can the refraction of light be determined? The extent to which a beam of light bends when it hits a different medium depends on the indices of refraction of the medium as well as the medium from which it came and the angle at which the light strikes the boundary between the two media. All materials have an index of refraction that depends on the speed of light in the material. The index of refraction is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material. A vacuum has a refractive index of 1, water is 1.33, and glass is around 1.5. The higher the index of refraction. The more slowly light travels through the medium. 
Snell's Law of Refraction, named after Dutch physicist Willebrord Snellius. 1580-1626, tells us how light behaves at a boundary between two different media. Consider the interface between two media where the refractive index of the top medium is lower than that of the bottom medium. According to Snell's law, when light hits the boundary between two materials it is bent from its original path to a smaller angle with respect to the line perpendicular to the surface of the interface. As the incoming, or incident angle increases, so does the refracted angle. When light goes from a medium with a higher refractive index into one with a lower index then it is bent away from the line perpendicular to the surface. Why do you sometimes get a shock when touching a doorknob? This annoyance happens usually on dry days after walking on carpeted floors. The friction between the carpet and your shoes or socks causes charges to be moved between your body and the carpet. Usually your body becomes negatively charged. When your hand approaches a doorknob the negative charges in your hand are attracted to the positive charges in the doorknob. Created by polarization, causing an electrical spark when the two charges meet. Circuit boards are sensitive to electrostatic buildup. And can be damaged if such a charge accumulates on sections of the circuit. What is color blindness? Some people are unable to see some colors due to an inherited condition known as color blindness. John Dalton, 1766 to 1844, a British chemist and physicist. Described color blindness in 1794. He was color blind himself, and could not distinguish red from green. Many color blind people do not realize that they cannot distinguish colors. This is potentially dangerous, particularly if they cannot distinguish between the colors of traffic lights or other safety signals. Those people who perceive red as green and green as red are known appropriately as red green color blind. Is there a net force on a polarized object? And can it exert a net force on the charged object, like the cellophane tape? Yes, because the electrostatic force is stronger at closer distances. Thus the attractive force between the unlike charges is stronger than the repulsive force between the like charges, and there is a net attractive force. When swimming underwater why is vision blurred when you open your eyes? But clear when wearing swimming goggles? Although the eye's lens changes shape to focus images on the retina, 
most of the refraction of light takes place during light's transition from air to the cornea. When water is substituted for air, the angles through which light is refracted is reduced. Producing a blurred image on the retina. What is nearsightedness and what can be done to correct it? Nearsighted vision means that a person can only clearly see objects that are relatively near the eye. Images from distant objects are focused in front of the retina. Nearsightedness, or myopia, is most often caused by a cornea that bulges out too much. The lens cannot be flattened enough to compensate, and so distant objects appear fuzzy. To correct for the short focal length of the lens. A concave lens is used to make the light rays diverge just enough so that the image will fall on the retina. So contact lenses to correct for myopia are thicker at the edges than at the center. What is a mirage? Mirages typically occur on hot summer days when surfaces such as sand, concrete, or asphalt are warm. Mirages look like pools of water on the ground. Along with an upside-down image of a building, vehicle, or tree in the distance. As one approaches a mirage, the puddle of water and the reflection seem to disappear. A mirage occurs because of a temperature difference between the air directly above the surface, which is hot and thus less dense, and the cooler, denser air a few meters above the surface. The denser air has a higher refractive index and that causes the light from an object to bend up toward the observer. As a result, the object is right side up while the refracted image is inverted and underneath the original object. The illusion of water is also a refracted image, the image of the sky. Mirages can only occur on hot surfaces and objects that are at relatively small angles in relation to the observer. Therefore, a person cannot see a mirage from an object that is just a few meters away. A mirage is not a hallucination, but instead a true and well-documented optical phenomenon. Why is it important to beware of excess electrostatic buildup when working with computer equipment? If you have ever installed a circuit board or card into a computer, the product probably was shipped in a static-free bag. This bag is designed to keep all excess static charge outside the bag. Many electronic circuits are sensitive to the electrostatic buildup and can be damaged if such a charge accumulates on sections of the circuit. Did you ever see a piece of paper attracted to a charged rod, touch it, and then jump away? How would that happen? If it touched the rod, it became charged with a charge like that of the rod. 
and so it would now be repelled. A conductor can also be charged after being polarized, but without touching the charged object. If you bring a large metal object, like a pie plate, near a charged rod, the positive charges will move to the far end of the plate. If you now touch this end briefly with your finger the positive charges will be pushed even further away into your finger. When you remove your finger the pie plate is negatively charged. This process is called charging by induction. Rubbing a glass rod with silk will achieve the same effect. The glass rod is positively charged, while the silk receives the excess negative electrons. The glass rod can still pick up small objects, but attracts the negative charges in those objects instead of the positive charges. When the pie plate is charged by induction it will be positively charged. What is a good insulator of electrical charge? In an insulator the electrons are strongly bound to their nuclei and thus cannot move through the material. Good insulators are nonmetals, such as plastic, wood, stone, and glass. Your skin is a good insulator, unless it is wet. What is a good insulator of electrical charge? In an insulator the electrons are strongly bound to their nuclei and thus cannot move through the material. Good insulators are nonmetals, such as plastic, wood, stone, and glass. Your skin is a good insulator, unless it is wet. How is the strength of an electrical force measured? British philosopher, theologian and scientist Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804 suggested that the force caused by static electricity might depend on distance the same way gravity does. Using Priestley's idea, the French physicist Charles Coulomb, 1736-1806, made quantitative measurements of the force of attraction and repulsion between charged objects using an apparatus shown in the accompanying illustration. He found that the force depended on the charge of the two objects and the distance between them. The relationship he found is called Coulomb's law and the unit of measurement of charge as the Coulomb, c. How is the strength of an electrical force measured? British philosopher, theologian, and scientist Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804 suggested that the force caused by static electricity might depend on distance the same way gravity does. Using Priestley's idea, the French physicist Charles Coulomb, 1736-1806 made quantitative measurements of the force of attraction and repulsion between 
charged objects using an apparatus shown in the accompanying illustration. He found that the force depended on the charge of the two objects and the distance between them. The relationship he found is called Coulomb's law and the unit of measurement of charge as the Coulomb, C. What is Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law describes the strength of the electrical force between two charged objects. The formula is F equals K, GQ2 slash R2. Where K is a constant equal to 9.0 x 109 nm2 slash C2, Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. The charges Q1 and Q2, measured in Coulombs represent the charges on the objects that cause the force F, measured in newtons. Finally, R is the distance between the centers of the two charged objects. A negative force is an attractive force, while a positive force is repulsive. What is Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law describes the strength of the electrical force between two charged objects. The formula is F equals K, GQ2 slash R2. Where K is a constant equal to 9.0 x 109 nm2 slash C2, Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. The charges Q1 and Q2, measured in Coulombs, represent the charges on the objects that cause the force F, measured in Newtons. Finally, R is the distance between the centers of the two charged objects. A negative force is an attractive force, while a positive force is repulsive. What is a Coulomb of charge? A coulomb of charge is equal to the charge of 6.24 x 1018 electrons, negative, or protons, positive. A coulomb is a very large charge. Objects that are charged by rubbing or induction have typically a microcoulomb, 10,6 c, of charge. What is a Coulomb of charge? A Coulomb of charge is equal to the charge of 6.24 x 1018 electrons, negative, or protons, positive. A Coulomb is a very large charge. Objects that are charged by Rubbing or induction have typically a microcoulomb, 10,6 c, of charge. What is an electroscope? An electroscope is a device used to measure the charge on an object. It consists of two metal leaves, either thin aluminum foil or gold leaf, attached to a metal rod. If you touch a charged object to the metal rod the two leaves will be charged with like charges. 
and so they will repel each other. The larger the charge, the greater the angle will be between the leaves. What is an electroscope? An electroscope is a device used to measure the charge on an object. It consists of two metal leaves, either thin aluminum foil or gold leaf, attached to a metal rod. If you touch a charged object to the metal rod the two leaves will be charged with like charges. And so they will repel each other. The larger the charge, the greater the angle will be between the leaves. What is an electric field? As discussed before, a gravitational field surrounds Earth or any object with mass. Another object with mass that is placed in this field will experience a gravitational force on it. In the same manner, an electric field surrounds a charged object. Another charged object placed in that field will experience a force. If a positive force creates the field then the force caused by the field on a negative force will be toward the source of the field. A positive charge will experience a force away from the source. The English physicist Michael Faraday, 1791-1867, was the first to use the concept of a field to describe the electrostatic force. What is an electric field? As discussed before, a gravitational field surrounds Earth or any object with mass. Another object with mass that is placed in this field will experience a gravitational force on it. In the same manner, an electric field surrounds a charged object. Another charged object placed in that field will experience a force. If a positive force creates the field then the force caused by the field on a negative force will be toward the source of the field. A positive charge will experience a force away from the source. The English physicist Michael Faraday, 1791-1867 was the first to use the concept of a field to describe the electrostatic force. What is the Leyden jar? Water can be stored in a jar. What is the Leyden jar? Water can be stored in a jar. In what can charge be stored? In November 1745 Ewald Jürgen von Kleist, 
1700-1748, Dean of a Cathedral in Pomerania. Put a nail into a small medicine bottle and charged it with an electrical machine. When he touched the nail he received a strong shock. In March 1746 Peter van Muschenbroek, 1692-1761, a professor at the University of Leiden in Holland, performed a similar experiment with the device, now called the Leiden jar. In what can charge be stored? In November 1745 Ewald Jürgen von Kleist, 1700-1748, Dean of a Cathedral in Pomerania. Put a nail into a small medicine bottle and charged it with an electrical machine. When he touched the nail he received a strong shock. In March 1746 Peter van Muschenbroek, 1692-1761, a professor at the University of Leiden in Holland, performed a similar experiment with the device, now called the Leiden jar. How does a Leiden jar work? A Leiden jar is an insulating container with conductors on the inner and outer surfaces. When charging the Leiden jar the source of charge is connected to a rod. Touching the inner conductor while the outer conductor is connected to ground. The inner and outer conductors become oppositely charged. It takes energy to move additional charges to the jar as the charges overcome the repulsive forces of the charges already on the conductors. The jar stores this electrical energy. If the inner and outer conductors are connected by a wire, the charges flow and make the two conductors neutral again. The modern capacitor is an updated version of the Leiden jar consisting of two conductors and an insulator. How does a Leiden jar work? A Leiden jar is an insulating container with conductors on the inner and outer surfaces. When charging the Leiden jar the source of charge is connected to a rod. Touching the inner conductor while the outer conductor is connected to ground. The inner and outer conductors become oppositely charged. It takes energy to move additional charges to the jar as the charges overcome the repulsive forces of the charges already on the conductors. The jar stores this electrical energy. If the inner and outer conductors are connected by a wire, the charges flow and make the two conductors neutral again. The modern capacitor is an updated version of the Leiden jar consisting of two conductors and an insulator. What were uses of the Leiden jar? In the late 18th and 19th centuries, People attempted to use the Leiden jar in a variety of ways. 
some felt that it could cure medical ailments. And many doctors used the jar as primitive electroshock therapy. Others used it as a demonstration device and for entertainment purposes. Still more people felt that it could be used in cooking. Try cooking a turkey with an electrical spark. What were uses of the Leiden jar? In the late 18th and 19th centuries, people attempted to use the Leiden jar in a variety of ways. Some felt that it could cure medical ailments. And many doctors used the jar as primitive electroshock therapy. Others used it as a demonstration device and for entertainment purposes. Still more people felt that it could be used in cooking. Try cooking a turkey with an electrical spark. What is the modern day version of a Leiden jar? The capacitor is the modern version of the Leiden jar. Like the jar, it consists of two conductors separated by an insulator. The insulators used can be air, a thin plastic film, or a coating of oxide on the metallic surface. One use of a capacitor is to store the energy needed to fire a flash lamp on a camera. A battery-powered circuit slowly charges the capacitor. When the flash lamp is triggered the capacitor's energy is quickly transferred to the lamp. Creating a brief, intense flash of light. Capacitors are also used in electronic devices from telephones. To televisions to store energy and reduce changes in voltage. What is the modern day version of a Leiden jar? The capacitor is the modern version of the Leiden jar. Like the jar, it consists of two conductors separated by an insulator. The insulators used can be air, a thin plastic film, or a coating of oxide on the metallic surface. One use of a capacitor is to store the energy needed to fire a flash lamp on a camera. A battery-powered circuit slowly charges the capacitor. When the flash lamp is triggered the capacitor's energy is quickly transferred to the lamp. Creating a brief, intense flash of light. Capacitors are also used in electronic devices from telephones. To televisions to store energy and reduce changes in voltage. What did Benjamin Franklin's famous kite experiment prove? Benjamin Franklin is probably most famous for flying kites in thunderstorms. In the mid-I-700s there were three different phenomena that had similar effects. You could draw sparks with frictional or static electricity. Lightning appeared to be a giant spark, and electric eels could cause shocks like static electricity. 
but no one knew if these three had the same or different causes. Franklin touched a Leiden jar to a key tied to the string of his kite. When sparks jumped from the cloud to the kite, the charges went down the string and charged the Leiden jar. Thus Franklin showed that lightning and frictional electricity were the same. Benjamin Franklin did not discover electricity, but he did show that lightning and frictional electricity were the same thing with his famous kite experiment involving a key and a Leiden jar. What did Benjamin Franklin's famous kite experiment prove? Benjamin Franklin is probably most famous for flying kites in thunderstorms. In the mid I-700s there were three different phenomena that had similar effects. You could draw sparks with frictional or static electricity. Lightning appeared to be a giant spark, and electric eels could cause shocks like static electricity. But no one knew if these three had the same or different causes. Franklin touched a Leiden jar to a key tied to the string of his kite. When sparks jumped from the cloud to the kite, the charges went down the string and charged the Leiden jar. Thus Franklin showed that lightning and frictional electricity were the same. Benjamin Franklin did not discover electricity, but he did show that lightning and frictional electricity were the same thing with his famous kite experiment involving a key and a Leiden jar. What is indigo? Indigo is the color between blue and violet in the spectrum, but almost no one can distinguish that color. What is the diffraction of light? Reflection and refraction use the ray model of light. But, when light goes through a very small opening the ray model is no longer sufficient. The wave properties of light become important. Suppose you pass light through a round aperture whose diameter you can change. Let the light fall on a screen. As you first begin reducing the size of the hole you will find the size of the bright spot shrinking. But, when the hole becomes very small a strange thing happens. The spot no longer shrinks, but its outer edge becomes fuzzy. Light begins to bend around the edge of the hole. Diffraction also occurs when light is sent through narrow slits or if. There are small objects that cast shadows in a broader beam of light. Diffraction occurs with all types of waves. You can often see it in water waves and it is one reason that. Sound waves spread when they come through a door or window. In what can charge be stored? In November 1745 Ewald Jürgen von Kleist, 1700-1748, Dean of a Cathedral in Pomerania. 
put a nail into a small medicine bottle and charged it with an electrical machine. When he touched the nail he received a strong shock. In March 1746 Peter van Muschenbroek, 1692-1761, a professor at the University of Leiden in Holland, performed a similar experiment with the device, now called the Leiden jar. How do optical fibers use total internal reflection to transmit information? Strands of glass fiber, commonly known as optical fibers. Use the principle of total internal reflection to transmit information near the speed of light. The fiber has an inner core of glass with a high refractive index surrounded by a cladding of glass with a lower index. A laser sends light into the end of a strand of fiber. When the light strikes the interface between the core and the cladding, the light is reflected back into the cable, continuing to move down the length of the fiber. Light or near-infrared radiation can travel kilometers through fibers without significant energy loss. One reason is the total internal reflection. The second reason is that are made from materials designed to absorb as little as possible of the infrared radiation. A second advantage of optical fibers is that information sent through the fibers is more secure. Because it doesn't escape the fiber and thus be accessible to those trying to intercept the information. Where are fiber optics used today? The transmission of light information through optical fibers has had a huge impact on the technological world. The medical field has benefited greatly from the use of flexible fiber optic bundles that enable the viewing of areas of the body that would otherwise be inaccessible. Communications is probably the field that is benefiting. The most from the advent of fiber optic technology. Long distance telephone, computer, and television signals use fiber optic cables. Some systems even use fiber optics to transmit information directly to the home or business. Fiber optics can transmit large amounts of data at high speeds, permitting hundreds of television channels. Very high speed internet connections, and telephone conversations to be sent and received at the same time. What is the modern day version of a Leiden jar? The capacitor is the modern version of the Leiden jar. Like the jar, it consists of two conductors separated by an insulator. The insulators used can be air, a thin plastic film, or a coating of oxide on the metallic surface. One use of a capacitor is to store the energy needed to fire a flash lamp on a camera. A battery-powered circuit slowly charges the capacitor. When the flash lamp is triggered the capacitor's energy is quickly transferred to the lamp. Creating a brief, intense flash of light. 
capacitors are also used in electronic devices from telephones. To televisions to store energy and reduce changes in voltage. What is a refractor telescope? The refractor telescope was the first telescope ever created. It employs one lens to gather, refract, and focus light toward an eyepiece. The eyepiece contains one or more lenses that create an image that the eye can see. What are some of the largest reflecting telescopes? The larger a reflecting telescope, the more light it can gather. The following is a list of some of the largest reflecting telescopes in the world. If you open your eyes underwater, can you see out of the water? Another example of total internal reflection can be seen when you are underwater. If you look straight up out of the water, you will see the sky and any other visible surroundings directly above the water. If, however, you look out of the water at an angle of 48 degrees or more from the vertical, you will not see out of the water, but instead will see a reflection from the bottom of the water. The next time you are in a pool or a lake, try looking up out of the water and you will see a point on the surface where you no longer can see out of the pool, for the light has reached its critical angle. What can you discover about static electricity? How about exploring the basic ideas of electrostatics? All you'll need is a roll of cellophane tape. Any brand will do the cheaper the better. Pull off a strip about 5 inches long, then fold over about 1 fourth inch at one end to serve as a handle. Press the tape on your desk or a table. Mark the strip with the letter B. Make a second identical tape and press it down next to the first. Holding the two tapes by their handles, quickly pull them off your desk. They'll probably be attracted to your hands, so shake them until they hang free. Then bring them closer. Together. What do you see? You should see them bending, evidence that there is a force between them. If they don't bend, Stick them on the desk again and again pull them off. Do they provide evidence that there is an attractive or repulsive force between them? Well say that pulling them off the table caused them to be charged. Although we have no evidence with what they are charged. They were obviously charged in the same way. So we can conclude that objects with like charges repel each other. By the way, well work toward an explanation why they're attracted to your hands. Press the two strips back on your desk. Now make two more strips the same length and press them on top of the first two strips. 
Mark these strips T to identify them as the top tapes, as opposed to the B or bottom tapes. Slowly pull the T and B pair of tapes off the desk together. If they are attracted to your hand then use the other hand. To gently pat both sides of them over their entire length. That should remove any residual charge from the pair of tapes. If not, pat them down again. You have a pair of objects with no charge. Holding the two handles of the pair rapidly pull them apart. Again, if they are attracted to your hands, shake them until they hang freely. Bring them closer together. Is there evidence of a force between them? Is it? Attractive or repulsive? You started with a pair of objects with no charge. Pulling them apart caused them to be charged, but not in the same way. Because they didn't repel each other, but attracted. Thus you can conclude that they must be charged differently, and objects with different charges attract. To keep your charge tapes you can hang them from the edge of your desk or a desk light. Make a second T and B pair and see if the two T, top, tapes are charged alike or differently. If the tapes stop interacting you can repeat the charging procedure as often as you like. Hang a T and a B tape so you can bring objects near them to see if there are forces between them. Make a list of the objects you tried and whether they attracted or repelled the T-tape. And the B-tape. Try your finger. Then try rubbing a plastic pen on a piece of wool. Try plastic rubbed by silk or polyester. Try glass and metal. Do some objects attract? Both tapes. Repel both tapes. Attract one and repel the other? If they do the latter, you can characterize them as being charged like the T-tape or like the B-tape. Well come back to understand why some objects can attract both kinds of charge. But no objects can repel both. <laughs>